Thank you for coming. Thanks for rearranging your morning to be here. It's great to see you. Uh, I'm Jen Reeves and this is Josie Serpa. So today we are talking about content and how frankly difficult it is. And so I actually there was a um, a stat that came out a couple weeks ago by the Content Marketing Institute that was really telling about this topic. It was after we'd already decided we wanted to do it. Um, it, was, it said that content creation is the number one most outsourced content activity regardless of company size, success, and marketing budget. So this is, an, this is just industry-wide. Creating content is just one of those things and we just really want to uncover um, why that is today. So, Content marketing isn't new. It's, it's kind of been in the works for about 15 years as a term, but the idea of content marketing is as old as the printing press. Um, this is an example of John Deere's The Furrow. This is, uh, they released their first edition in 1895. Uh, Johnson & Johnson had one like years even earlier. So um, this is a magazine. It was a quarterly publication um, for American farmers about American farming. John Deere did not, they advertised for in their own publication, but they didn't actually include anything about their company in the editorial. It was all very value-based um, and just helping farmers run their businesses. And I wanted to talk about this example in particular because the furrow um, peaked circulation in 1912 at four million and John Deere bought its own electric printing press. It could print, and for it would be about, in today's dollars, about a million dollars. Um, they, the printing press, I think it could print two colors, and over an eight hour span, it could actually produce 50,000 copies. That's 640 hours to make four million. If you think about that, so this is a quarterly publication, it would have taken almost three months just to print the damn things if you did like a one every eight hours. Anyways, or like once out every eight hours. Um, what's my point? I bring this up. <laughs> because content marketing was always this hard. If you think about it, this would have been a huge expense. Every issue would have had to be very valuable, very intentional because it was a huge investment. Just imagine mailing these things in 1895, it's insane. Um, but circulation was huge. It's, uh, the furrow still runs today. Their circulation, I think, now is around, it's less than a million now. Um, but they are still going strong and they still retain the same editorial mission. So, oh, I have a clicker. I can <laughs> make this happen. So then what changed? <laughs> what changed? Well, the internet changed and all of a sudden publishing became um, very cheap very easy and as marketers we just jumped on board everyone you could start a blog in seconds some of us did start a blog i did we don't need to talk about it <laughs> um what interestingly this uh content marketing as a trend sort of rose during the recession this is just an aside for your interest um as brands were clawing back marketing dollars and in ad spend. You could pay somebody internally to put something on this newfangled thing called Facebook instead of actually buying ad space. So you could still kind of continue that, those marketing efforts. So in about 2010-ish, I don't know, content is crowned king. And this is not just because brands are trying this out, this is now because brands are realizing, oh, we can create value, we can build audiences without paying a third party to access the audience. Instead of saying, hey, I'm going to give you money to access your audience now. Oh, now I'm doing the thing. I'm sorry. Now it's my audience and I can own them and I can speak to them however I want to. And this built relationships and this built trust. And actually over time we realized, oh, we can actually improve the sales process. We can convert with this content. So um, the value of content marketing just rose and now content is king. I, I would almost even say it's not even 
king, it's so normal that it's not even king, it's just what we all do. 26% of the average marketing budget is spent on content. That's a B2B stat, the B2C stat is, yeah, 22%. It's a $300 billion industry this year. In two years, it's projected to be up. Did I say three billion? I meant 300 billion and 400 billion in two years. So this is just the norm. This is just what we're doing now. We can't create enough of the stuff. And so now that content's become the norm, what we're seeing now is that there is so much content. And what's happening is um, companies are starting to say the same things. They're starting to share the same viewpoints. You're getting a lot of this me too in the sense of they want to all say the same things, cover the same trending topics. Um, sales content is starting to become thin because we're trying to hit certain word counts. Um, websites are becoming larger because we're continually upping our content. Um, and social platforms are starting to increase and kind of get out of control. Um, and sooner or later, this is what we end up with. <laughs> so why does this happen? Why, do we, why are we buried in content? Well, it's because we're trying to rush the process. We're trying to create a quality product while still saving time and effort. Um, and think about, you know, if you were writing a novel or making a television show, um, think about how much time that would take. Think about the resources and the level of research that would go into it. Yeah, as content marketers, our job is to um, build connection with an audience. And no matter what, that connection is a time-consuming connection to build. So content marketing was always hard. It didn't get harder, actually. It kind of got easier. I think the problem is that we assumed it should be easier. That was, that's the change. It was always difficult, and everybody knew that before. They, would, they still invested in it because the idea of content is still a really good one. This idea that we can connect um, quite personally at times with people that we're selling to or just people that we want to influence is still a really powerful idea. The difference is that our assumption about what would go into that connection is what changed. And so um, this, I don't want to make this like a, a hopeless conversation because I think there are still ways that we get in our own way about content. And I think there are still ways that we can kind of um, reimagine what we're doing and just kind of uh, pivot a little bit um, what we're doing. So we just want to talk about how it's not, we can't make content easy, but we can make it, we can make it so that we are not getting in our own way, I guess. And so uh, the first thing that you could do is document a content strategy, which feels very uh, basic, but actually only 41% of B2B companies have a documented content strategy. It's even less so for B2C companies. I think it's 33%. And it's crazy because uh, a documented content strategy is the number one determiner of success in a content marketing program, which is, it makes a lot of sense when you think about it, um, but it's interesting that we all just kind of, or many of us started just creating content and diving in. We didn't necessarily stop to think, okay, well, why are we doing it? What are, what, what's our goal here? So the risk of not having one, um, well, there are, there are many. And one of them is, and I, I would say the biggest one is we misallocate resources. Because we're not, we haven't all agreed on the goal, we're not really agreeing on how much investment um, it, we should put in to optimize those results because we haven't agreed on what those results should be. Um, we haven't really made a clear approval process, uh, so we get a lot of approval by committee. If you've ever had that, if you've ever gone through approval by committee, you know that this is not ideal uh, in terms of quality, to be honest, um, but also timing. Um, not having the right people in place. If we're not setting that clear vision, we're probably not hiring the right people to uh, execute the content. Um, a salesperson, for example, while a great wealth of information is probably not the best person to run a branded newsroom, right? Um, you also get mavericks, off-brand content, people going rogue. If there's no strategy, you got, you could end up with a lot. And even even if it is, a, even if you're rogue. Uh, content creators in your organization are doing a really good job, that's awesome, but you're still left with a pile of disjointed assets that aren't really 
working for you. And when you consider the investment that you're making, you really do want those assets working for you. And so one of the main advantages, again, of documenting this content strategy is to get everyone on board. Um, everyone should be aligned on the content that you're creating. You want to outline your goals, think about what you want to accomplish. You want to outline your audience. Who are you speaking to? You want to outline your story and your plan. How are you going to be executing these pieces of content when you go to create it? Um, set realistic expectations. So think about what realistic KPIs you want to be measuring once you um, create that content, uh, as well as realistic timing. How much time do you think it's going to take you? Um, choosing the right people and the process. Jeeves spoke about this a little bit before, but you know, selecting the right internal people in order to you know, view your content, edit your content, um, and publish your content. And really having this um, document content strategy really allows you to have larger business conversations about the investment, about how much time and budget that you are willing to put into your content programs. So one of the ways, if you're finding that you're getting overwhelmed and you're doing all the things and, and, and you're getting really um, in your head about it, one, one of the things that we recommend is to do less and obsess. Just kind of whittle down, pick one thing, and be great at it. So uh, whether that's one audience, whether that's one piece of content in the buyer journey, focus on one thing first and really try to be great and make it as, as best as you can and then grow from there. Yeah, and I think it's worth mentioning, um, this is sort of um, a especially good piece of advice for a regularly, um, what's the word I'm looking for, like an ongoing content marketing program we're under pressure to speak to every audience on every channel and on every stage of the buyer journey. And it's just so much. And so we're not suggesting that you shouldn't try to speak to those key audiences. Um, when it comes to one-off content, sure, you might want to invest in some one-off content on your website. So when people are in, on your website kicking the tires, they've got something for them that is completely appropriate. But in terms of an ongoing content program, if you're struggling because you're trying to uh, communicate with a lot of people and a lot of audiences, we would suggest actually just give yourself permission to just, just pick one. Pick one audience at one stage of the buyer journey, one channel, maybe two if this is scary to you, and, and just really invest there and grow that and, 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 and perfect that process and then you can scale hopefully. And if you're in an organization where that's just not possible to only speak to one audience, it really requires that extra investment. And hence back to the strategy and back to the, those business conversations and getting everybody on board as they understand just how much goes into that process. Um, finally, just making the most of what you have. Uh, we, because we've all kind of scrambled and we're making so much content, it's really important that we're actually like doing something with that content and making the most of it. And that could be iterating it, it could be repurposing it, updating it. Um, but it's also really, um, you know, playing nicely with robots, really making sure that um, it's optimized so yeah. that people are finding this thing that we just invested in making. Right, so there used to be a time when you would create content you would share it a little bit, people would come and find it. Um, that's really not the case anymore. Um, so SEO is a great way to kind of get your content found um, by search engines. Uh, and one way to do that is to start researching search queries and trends. So think about what questions your audience is asking and use that um, as start of your brainstorming sessions on what kind of content that you can create and use that to your advantage. Um, and then once you've, once you've created that content, make sure to input your captions, your tags, and your keywords um, to make it as searchable as possible and to kind of get your uh, content found. And then look at distribution. So um, again, we can't expect audiences to just stumble upon your content once you've created it. Um, organic reach is actually dropping. Um, the average organic reach this year is 5.5% of your page followers, which is um, not very high at all. Uh, it actually is a 2.2% drop from last year. So we're seeing that year over year organic reach is going down um, and paid is actually 
uh, a very necessary or is becoming a very necessary tool um, in getting your content seen. So you, we really want to need to be strategic and uh, about how we place the content and then how we promote it. This is especially true if you think of how you consume content in your own world. If you're reading, for example, a Globe and Mail article, is it that you went on globeandmail.com to read that article or did, did somebody share it with you or did it come up in maybe your LinkedIn feed or your Facebook feed, whatever, and that's how you consumed it? Chances are it was through a share or a feed uh, it coming up in your feed versus you actually going to the home page and clicking and finding that article. So we really need to make sure we're distributing our content with that in mind. Just putting it up on our website isn't um, enough anymore. Um, what else do I want to say about, can't remember, move on. <laughs> oh, click the computer, not the screen. Oh. Now it's not going. Oh. I got, it, now it's like, you've clicked too much. If it's going to like go through. Way. Yeah, do it that way. Yeah. There we go. Great. I just do um, it from there. <laughs> so making notes of your content. If you just started, uh, I'm just including this because if you have just started a content program and you're like, well, we're really not getting engagement. We don't really understand what's going. And, we, and we're doing, all, we are doing SEO and we're all doing it. Just give it time. Uh, it takes a little bit of time for search engines to rank your content. Um, and it takes even longer to build an audience. If you think of uh, Adobe's CMO, it took them 10 years to get where they are today in building that audience, and that was Adobe. Uh, so um, take heart. If, you're, if you believe in what you're doing, um, give it a bit of time, which doesn't mean let it go 10 years before you pivot. You're obviously going to want to iterate and, and mine that data and, and look into the research that you're seeing. but um, Certainly expect that it's going to take a while, and this is just good to know when you're having those upfront investment conversations with your leadership. If, if you're asking them for investment into a content marketing program, you, they are going to need to know that ROI might not be immediate, right? It's doing, oh, there you go. yes. <laughs> so we talked about kind of like, those were like the little press on things. This is, a, this is when, when to pivot, when to just stop and assess. And it's a quality issue. Uh, if you are in doubt of the quality that you are putting out, just stop, just stop now. It doesn't mean you can't continue, but stop and assess what's going on. Because if it's not good, you're just adding to the triceratops dung pile that we saw in slide four. We really need to make sure that what we're making is good. And by the way, when I say good, this isn't a perfectionism thing and this isn't a production value thing. You can be scrappy, you can be a small business um, and make really good stuff that really connects with, with that target audience. Um, and you can be very mindful of that without you know, spending you know, millions and millions of dollars. Um, so I just want to say that, but if you are not giving somebody something that is just so good, that's when you stop, that's when you pivot, that's when you just assess and see what you can do. And maybe that is a do less thing. Maybe it's like, okay, we're doing too much and it's affecting quality, or we have some unrealistic expectations, or we're, whatever it is. Um, yeah, that's my little preaching uh, moment. Yes. yes, so as Jen was saying, Please. take an honest look at what you're producing. Um, ask yourself, you know, is it interesting? Is it intelligent? Is it novel? Are you bringing something new to the table? Is it useful? Is it entertaining? Will people remember it? Is it thoughtful? Um, you know, these, you don't have to hit all of these things uh, as you're creating content, but they are good questions to ask to help determine how much value you're bringing to your audience. And a good thing to know is your audience knows. We're all marketing literate. We know, especially if we work in marketing, but even beyond, we know when we're being marketed to. And we have to be cognizant of that type of media and marketing literacy when we're creating content. Um, people will know and people will react if they smell something fishy or suspect about your content. Um, and it is worth it to do it well. It, it builds brand perception and loyalty, and uh, it can convert and retain. So it is definitely something worth doing well. The quality piece is, uh, yeah, is a worthwhile yes. investment. Yes, and even though it can be hard, 
it is worth it to do. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, uh, we did want to talk about uh, how content can be valuable to a business beyond lead generation. I think that is kind of an important piece. We have sort of this, um, we, we want to input value and then extract it right away. Um, if we, you know, if we just write this thing, then they're going to click and then they're going to go in our email thing and then we're, they're going to generate a lead and it's going to go to Salesforce and then one of our people will call them. Have you ever read anything and then a salesperson called you like that day? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... It's one way to do it. It's one way to do it. So I don't want to throw stones, but that's one way to do it. Um, and listen, lead generation is, uh, it makes a lot of sense. And certainly, this is, it's certainly not a bad thing. It certainly works. Maybe don't call people that day because they read a white paper, for goodness sake. But like, maybe you want to nurture them a little bit. That's fine. But um, there is value in having an audience that is beyond uh, sales. For example, um, you can collect data about your audience, and you can use that data to improve your product, to improve your marketing efforts. Um, if you have, um, if you're kind of running a content program outside of your main brand, for example, say you have a magazine or I don't know, you're making a movie. I don't know. You can monetize. Maybe you can make merch. That is valuable to your company. Um, brand loyalty and retention. So many content uh, marketing plays are about loyalty and retention. The John Deere example, that's a retention play. And he, not he, the company invested a million bucks to, to make sure that they could keep doing that. So that was a very worthwhile investment for them. And of course, advocacy and word of mouth. Even if somebody never buys something from your company, if you're offering them something that helps them, they might share your stuff. They might um, tell a friend about uh, what your brand is producing. Yeah. OK. So now that we've gone over you know, what makes content hard, we wanted to uh, provide some examples that to kind of inspire you to go out and create some, some cool stuff, some cool content. Yeah. Um, so how many people have seen the no frills Twitter? I'm seeing some nods. Yeah. Um, I really like this example. It started in June. Um, this is sort of like really no frills language. It's really literal. And uh, it's, it's gone really well. It's not a campaign. It's just an ongoing Twitter um, account. And I bring this one up because it is an example of content being super creative, super on brand, really connecting with people, and being really inexpensive. It's just a Twitter account. It's just a yellow square with a word on it. And I'm, this, is me not, this is not me suggesting that creative is um, cheap and easy and fast. But in terms of execution, this would be a very, very affordable campaign that I think would be within most businesses' reach. Um, craft. We in Canada, we have the what's cooking. Do you, does anyone, my mom is like a what's cooking. Anyways, this, uh, so Crafts Food and Family, this is the US um, print publication. And I bring this up because it's an example of monetizing your content program. Uh, Craft sends this out to a million paid subscribers. This is a branded play. <laughs> Everybody knows what's going on. So they have some great recipes in here and other like family type content. Um, but their recipes include craft products. That's, they're, they're, they're not hiding it. Um, but their content is so good, people will pay for it. So that is pretty compelling. Um, but for those who don't, they also have like an email. Um, situation and you can also download their stuff. Um, but 5.5 million circulation of people just saying, hey, advertise to me, you know? That's, that's something. So the Lego movie. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of parents here um, who know and love this movie. Um, and not only was it a great family uh, film and funny and clever for adults and kids, but it actually was a really great brand retention piece. Um, you know, it, it helped to remind people how creative Lego was and how fun it could be. Um, and then it also gave Lego the opportunity to sell new sets um, and to promote new characters. Uh, it made $257.8 million in the U.S. and Canada. Um, they continue to remain relevant in the toy market. There's a lot of flashy toys out there and Lego is pretty... Um, basic, but it kind of goes into how creative it could be, and you are what you make it. Um, and yeah, and they've come out with another one since then, and 
they're doing great. Oh, I mentioned Adobe CMO before. So this operates kind of outside Adobe's um, primary business. It's kind of an arm's length uh, digital magazine for chief marketing officers. Uh, they talk about marketing trends, technology. They will advertise some Adobe products, but they, um, their writers are not Adobe writers. They hire freelancers, and they only talk about Adobe when it actually makes sense to do so. Um, yeah, and what they do is they use this data to help them program their annual summit conference. So Adobe's annual summit conference, that's how they have um, made the business case for this website. So um, Salesforce is Dreamforce. This is another way of kind of expanding your content to kind of go beyond the blog. Um, so doing events. Um, Dreamforce is Salesforce's technology conference. They hold it every year. Um, and it's a great example of brand loyalty where these, you know, they have hundreds of thousands of registered attendees. Um, a lot of them go every year to see what's new in technology. Um, and they all, it's also a great opportunity for Salesforce to kind of introduce new products and what it can mean for their audience. Um, yeah, and it's just, it's a great, it's a great different example of, of another way to get out there. Uh, and then another one that we thought was really cool was this podcast called The Message from GE. Um, and what this was, uh, was a science fiction kind of podcast where scientists would actually go and decode extraterrestrial messages using GE's technology. Um, and even though it was branded, it was so interesting and the content was so engaging that it actually became one of the most popular podcasts of its time. I think it came out like a couple years ago. Um, yeah, a couple, couple years ago. Uh, yeah, so it reached number one on the iTunes podcast charts, um, and it had 7.7 .7 million downloads. So it was really cool. Yeah. Um, and in case those uh, examples feel maybe a little daunting, if you're like, oh, I can't make a movie, uh, my brain can't make a movie, yeah, that's, that's fine. Maybe you can't make a movie, but there are lots of ways that you can make your content relevant and build that bridge to your audience and make it creative. And so I just really want to challenge you to think about your content in a different way. Maybe if your blog is working, awesome. If your newsletter is working, awesome. But maybe there's something um, a little higher level. Maybe there's a different format you could try. Maybe there's something that would connect to your audience a little bit differently and a little and where they live. So. Yes, we can. Go forth, create. Thank you, Thank everyone, you. for being an attentive audience. We, we hope that we've made content a little less hard for you. Um, and yeah, if anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to answer them.